Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a client and a flight centre agent about making changes to an airline booking. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Mrs. Gray. This is Bert Stock speaking from Finnegan's Flight Centre. I can now confirm your flight to Singapore. Oh, good. No problems, I hope. No, everything is in order. So we got the dates we wanted? Yes, leaving from Hong Kong on the 25th of July and arriving in Singapore later the same day. How long does the flight last? Oh, about 3 hours 40 minutes. So we'd get there at... 9.45. In the evening? No, 9.45 a.m. But that means we'd be leaving at... Your flight leaves Hong Kong at 6.05 a.m. So we'd have to check in an hour before that. Mrs. Gray, check-in closes 60 minutes before your scheduled departure. If you arrive after check-in has closed, you will not be able to board the flight and you may forfeit your entire fare. I would strongly recommend that you arrive at the check-in counter at least 120 minutes before your departure time. So you're saying we should be at the airport no later than 4.05 a.m.? That's correct. But we'd have to get up in the middle of the night to arrive by that time. Can't we get a later flight? Not on July 25th. Now, there is a later flight on certain weekdays, but not at the weekend. Well, we must go with what we've got then, because we're not at all flexible on the dates because of work commitments. Can I confirm that you want to return on August 7th? Yes, that's the idea. Flight VQ239 will depart from Singapore at 9.20am on August 7th. Oh, that's a much more civilised time. Tell me, the time zone is the same, isn't it? We don't gain or lose an hour along the way. There's no change in the time zone, so you can expect to be back at around 1pm. Does that suit you? Oh, absolutely. I'll have time to unpack before dinner. We're expecting to meet friends at the new seafood restaurant at 8 o'clock. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Mrs. Gray, I'll send you all these details by an email or letter of confirmation. Which do you prefer? Well, email is faster, but we've been having difficulties with our internet connection. So, if you could post it out, I'd appreciate that. Now, just one or two other things to check before final confirmation. You're booked on a lifelight ticket. What does that mean exactly? Well, you'll only have carry-on baggage. Is that right? Oh, yes. That was the original idea. It's so much quicker not having to wait around at the luggage carousel, but... Yes? Can you remind me of the allowance again? With a lifelight ticket, you're allowed 10 kilos of hand baggage. I'm not sure that's such a good idea now. Oh? Well, apparently we're going to have to attend quite a few formal functions while we're away. So I think I'm going to need a real suitcase to fit the extra clothes and shoes in. Well, that's not a problem. I can upgrade you to the next level and change your ticket to Easy Flight. There will be an extra charge, of course. How much? $30 per checked-in item of luggage, weighing no more than 22 kilos per item.
Well, we'll probably manage with just a single suitcase between the two of us. Is it possible to do it like that? Yes, of course. You can take the easy flight option, and your husband can stay with the light flight ticket. Great. I'll give you your reservation number now, so if you need to make any further changes or inquiries, you can just quote this reference. Okay? Yes, I have a pen and paper. What is it? L four G B W F. L four G B U F. W F. Thanks. I've got it now. At this point, I can actually book your seat numbers. Do you have any preference, window or aisle? Oh, not by the window, Bert. You see, I'm quite a nervous flyer, and I don't like looking out. What's more, my husband likes a bit of room to stretch his legs. I would be good. Great. That's sorted then. As I said, I'll send you the details, and if you need to talk to the agency again, just quote that reference number I gave you. Thanks so much. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a crime prevention and fire safety officer talking to a group of new residents. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good evening. Last week, Mr. Jenkins spoke to you about home security. My name is Malcolm Fletcher, and tonight I'm going to talk about personal safety when driving, and fire safety in the home. Of course, we shouldn't go around perpetually frightened of all the bad things that might happen to us. But there are some sensible precautions that we should all take to avoid getting hurt. You probably know already that a great number of serious assaults occur in the vicinity of motor vehicles. You should always be alert when walking to your car, and check the rear seat of your car before getting in. This is especially important in isolated parking areas or the far corners of major shopping complexes. Now, once inside your car, get into the habit of locking the doors. Always keep the windows up and the doors locked, especially if you're travelling alone. If at all possible, steer clear of isolated roads after dark. Even with all the high-tech communication devices we have today, many serious crimes are committed on lonely back roads. Make sure your vehicle is mechanically sound. And ensure you have adequate fuel in the tank at all times. If your vehicle does break down in a lonely spot, lift the bonnet and then lock yourself inside the car and call for help on your mobile phone. Never, under any circumstances, leave your vehicle and go with a stranger to seek help. It is better to wait for the police or some other emergency vehicle to stop and offer assistance. Of course, you should never pick up a hitchhiker. Some of the most serious crimes committed in this country have been a direct result of this foolish practice. 
If you think you're being followed by someone in another vehicle, ideally you should drive to the nearest police station. But if there isn't one within easy reach, drive to the nearest open service station or shop, or the nearest occupied house. Now we are lucky enough to have a police station in this area. Do any of you know where it is? Look at this map on the screen, and I'll show you how to get to it from the community centre where you are now. Then, when you get home, you can work out how to get there from other directions. From the community centre, go along Bayview Street toward Maiden Avenue. At the roundabout, take the second exit onto Lee Street. Go past the medical clinic, and at the next roundabout, take the first exit onto Moore Street. You should continue on Moore Street until you have passed the little block of shops on the left and the church on the right. Stay on Moore Street until you go over the bridge, and then turn right into Canal Street. You'll find the police station on the corner of Canal Street and Cockleshell Court. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now let's move on to fire safety. Before I talk to you about safety precautions and procedures, I'd like to mention some of the effects of smoke and heat on humans. There are four ingredients of fire, namely oxygen, fuel, heat, and chain reactions. Almost all materials burn, and most household goods burn very easily. The air we breathe contains about twenty-one percent oxygen. As fire burns, it consumes oxygen, thereby reducing the oxygen content of the air. When that is reduced to fifteen percent, oxygen deficiencies in body tissue cause an impairment of muscle control and dexterity. At between ten and fourteen percent, judgment and reasoning are affected. Oxygen reduction to between six and ten percent results in unconsciousness, and breathing stops. Sounds scary, doesn't it? But that's not all you have to worry about. Many materials in the home give off toxic gases as they burn. The main toxic gases are carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and nitrogen oxide. Carbon monoxide is an invisible and odorless gas produced in all fires. It takes up the place of oxygen in the blood, thereby reducing the supply of oxygen to the brain. The effect of carbon dioxide is to increase the heart rate and stimulate the rate of breathing, causing an increase in the intake of other toxic gases, which contributes to, amongst other symptoms, serious oxygen deprivation. Hydrogen sulfide, on the other hand, affects the nervous system, causing dizziness and pain in the respiratory system. It does occur naturally in volcanic gases and hot springs, and it also results from the bacterial breakdown of organic matter. You're probably familiar with it. You know, it has that characteristic odor of rotten eggs. But make no mistake, in large concentrations, it's deadly. Lastly, nitrogen oxide is another extremely poisonous gas at high levels of concentration, which deadens feeling in the throat and lungs, causes swelling in the throat, and a build-up of fluids in the lungs. That is the end of part two. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students in the political studies department of a New Zealand tertiary institution. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning. Now, you've come to discuss how our parliament works, is that right? Yes, it's a bit different from some of the other democracies we've studied, and we're a bit confused. Well, what do you know? We know that the system of government in New Zealand is a constitutional monarchy, but we're not sure how the power is shared or who has ultimate authority. The government is formed from a democratically elected House of Representatives. Is that the same as Parliament? Yes, the House of Representatives is what is commonly called Parliament. And the government advises the Sovereign, who is our head of state. The Sovereign is the Queen of England, right? She lives in England and she is the Queen of England, but when we refer to her as our Sovereign, we say she is Queen Elizabeth II of New Zealand. But how can she be our head of state if she doesn't live here? I know that she has a representative here. Oh yes, the Governor General. That's right. Now, by convention, the Sovereign is the source of all executive legal authority in New Zealand. So she's the boss? Well, you could say that. However, she or her representative almost always acts on the advice of the government, in all but the most exceptional circumstances, that is. So where does the real power lie? Good question. Our system is based on the principle that power is distributed across three branches of government, the parliament, the executive and the judiciary. But Parliament makes the law, doesn't it? That's right. So what's the point of the other two? Well, you need a body to administer the law. That's the executive, made up of ministers of the Crown, and the judiciary interprets the law through the courts. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. When I'm watching American legal programs on TV, I always hear people talking about the Constitution and how something is unconstitutional. What exactly is a Constitution? It's a document outlining the basic laws or principles by which a country is governed. Do we have one? No. This would actually make a good topic for next semester's debate. There's quite a bit of controversy over that particular issue. New Zealand has no single written constitution or any form of law that is higher than the laws passed in Parliament. OK, I think I've got that. The rules about how our system of government works are all contained in the laws that have been passed by Parliament? Those laws are called Acts of Parliament but there are also other documents issued under the authority of the Queen and some relevant UK Acts of Parliament. Really? But it's all written down, right? Not exactly. There are several unwritten constitutional conventions as well. I can see why this would make a good topic for debate. Hmm. Altogether, though, our system is quite simple because our Parliament is unicameral. What does that mean? It means there is just one chamber, the House of Representatives, and there is no upper house. I see. By upper house you mean a second house, like a senate? 
In the American model, yes, but the British have a House of Lords as their upper house, don't they? Yes, but the Lords don't have to be elected. But we have elections every three years to elect our people's representatives. Yes, and the electoral system is called proportional representation. A lot of democracies have quite different voting systems. Why is ours called MMP? That stands for mixed member proportional representation. So that's why each elector has two votes. Exactly. One for a local member of parliament for the particular electoral district you live in, and one for a preferred political party. So that's where the proportional part of it comes in. Political parties are represented in parliament in proportion to the share of votes each party has won in the party vote in the general election. Any more questions? No, not at this stage. Thank you for your time today. Okay. See you in class tomorrow. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a talk on the topic of decision making and problem solving. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today, as part of your business management course, we're starting a unit on problem-solving skills and decision-making. Let's start with a powerful decision-making technique developed by Edward de Bono in his book Six Thinking Hats, which you'll find on your required reading list. The method works by compelling you to move outside your habitual ways of thinking. Often, success in business results from rational, positive thinking. But these approaches, used in combination with quite different ones, will improve the overall quality of your decision-making. Now, each thinking hat has a different colour and represents a different style of thinking. Let's start with the white hat. When you're wearing the white hat, you look at the information you have. You look at historical trends and try to analyse them. And you take account of gaps in your knowledge and try to fill them. On the other hand, if you're wearing the red hat, you listen to your gut reaction and instincts. You also try to imagine the intuitive response that other people might have. How would other people who are unaware of your reasoning and all the facts at your disposal, react. That brings us to the black hat next. Black hat thinking, as its name suggests, is cautious and defensive, and you examine why something might not work. It all sounds very negative, but it is essential to know what the weak points in a plan of action might be. It permits you to alter your approach, eliminate problems, or at least be ready with contingency plans if the worst happens. After all, it is better to spot the fatal flaw and know the risks before you undertake a new enterprise. The opposite viewpoint, of course, comes with the yellow hat. It helps you to continue when the outlook is gloomy or the problems seem insurmountable. Think positively and you'll see all the advantages and values of the decision and all the opportunities it brings. Let's look at what the green hat has to offer now. 
It stands for freewheeling, imaginative, inspired, innovative thinking, where there is little or no criticism of ideas. Original solutions to a problem are more likely to arise when you're wearing the green hat. Finally, the blue hat. This is the hat that the person chairing the meeting wears. The blue hat is in charge and organizes the meeting. He or she can point activities in the direction of other colored hats when required. For example, if ideas have dried up, the blue hat will suggest more green hat thinking. If there is too much exuberance and enthusiasm for an idea, the blue hat will ask for black hat thinking to ensure that any possible defects have been addressed. Needless to say, you can use six thinking hats by yourself, but it really comes into its own when participants with different thinking styles come together to make a sound decision. Now, another useful way to generate radical ideas or creative solutions to a problem is brainstorming. You're all familiar with the term brainstorming, and I'm sure you've all done it from time to time. But even in well-managed groups, sometimes big egos intimidate less confident participants, who in turn may feel pressured to conform, or are inhibited because of their respect for authority. What I would suggest in this case is a system called the stepladder technique. If you follow the flowchart on the board, you'll see there are just five basic steps. Firstly, members contribute on an individual level. The task is presented to them. They are given time to think and form their own opinions about how to solve the problem. You do this before you get them together as a group. Secondly, you form a core group of just two people and allow them time to discuss the topic of concern. In the third step, a third member is added to the core group. But, and this is most important, that third person presents his or her thoughts before having a chance to hear the proposals that have already been put forward. When all three have explained their ideas, then they can consider their options collectively. In step four, the same process is repeated. A word of advice here. Keep the group small to maximize effectiveness. You can limit the numbers to four or add more, but... I wouldn't go above seven, not if you want a good quality decision. The last step in the process is to get a final decision, but only after all members have been included and had the opportunity to communicate their ideas. The main benefit of this step-by-step -step method is to give even the most diffident and quietest people the chance to share their ideas before they can be influenced by others. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.